Let's just check and we'll see if we're ready to begin. Hi, Councillor Crawford. It's Carly with City Clerks confirming we do have quorum and I believe we have the first three speakers down checked and ready to go. Excellent. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Welcome back, members. Hope you had a good lunch. Hope you didn't go outside because it looks to be pretty stormy out there. Um, my name is Gary Crawford, the chair of the budget committee. Uh, and clerks just have you yeah, just heard have confirmed that we do have a uh, quorum. Today's meeting is being held by video conference and city staff are also connected to the meeting by video conference and as city hall remains closed, the public will continue to participate electronically and watch the meeting streaming live on YouTube at youtube.com slash Toronto City Council Live and ask for everyone's patience. Uh, we have been having a few de te technical difficulties, um, primarily with people who are listening. If you cannot, if we may not be able to hear you, you can hear us. You may have to turn on your mic or you may have to log back in, but we've had a few technical difficulties this morning. Um, uh, I would like to remain staff to keep the mics muted and the videos turned off. Um, Members, please remember that your mic is muted and your video is turned on the opposite so that we uh, and the public will know that you are here and participating. Um, if there's any visiting members of council, also put on your, your video so we can uh, see you and the clerks can record your attendance. Um, first up, are the declarations of interest under the Municipal Interest Conflict of Interest Act? Seeing none, uh, purpose of today's meeting is the opportunity to give the public um, to speak to the special of uh, the budget committee. Uh, this is a special meeting of the budget committee to hear speakers on the 2021 capital and operating budgets. Um, we have, I think about 25, 27 people who are registered to speak to us today. Um, and they are all connected by phone and computer. Uh, the clerk has posted the speakers list online at toronto.ca slash council. And you just have to click on the speakers button for today's meeting to see the complete list of names and, and generally where you are on the list. I just want to give you an, a quick uh, update on how it'll work. You will have five minutes to speak to the budget committee. Um, you'll be timed. I'll give you a bit of a nudge just before five minutes in the event that you need all that time. Um, and then after that, uh, there may be some questions from councillors um, and you will be asked those questions and, and I will uh, organize that for you. Um, after your speaking time, you can stay connected and listen to the rest of the meeting on YouTube. Also, the clerk has received emails and communications from the public about the 2021 budgets. Um, this isn't the only way to, so we can hear you. You can also uh, send in written submissions. Um, and that is on CMP, which is the clerk's meeting portal for, for councillors to review. Uh, and I also encourage the public to send in their comments uh, if you don't do it here. And even if you do it here, send it in, uh, send it in uh, um, uh, online at buc at toronto.ca. Any, and oh, just want to let you know, so what will happen next is, is we'll be doing public deputations today and tonight. Um, and then we will be meeting as a committee on January 28th and February 4th for our wrap up meetings. That's where the committee will make decisions. Uh, budget committee will make decisions that will go off to executive and then recommendations from there. We'll go to city council for a full debate um, in uh, in February. Any questions on the process? Great. If not, we will begin. Um, again, what I'll do is I'll read out the first, uh, I'll read out three names just so you kind of get a sense of that you're coming up. Um, and then clerks will begin. Um, there's a clock that we'll be timing you with and um, wish you all the best of luck. First three speakers, Jasmine Moulton, then Susan McMurray, then Jennifer Chambers. Jasmine, are you with us? I am. Can everybody hear me? We can hear you and you have five minutes and welcome. Wonderful. Well, thank you. I'm proud to be here today representing the taxpayers of Toronto. I'm the Ontario Director of the Canadian Taxpayers Federation, a nonprofit citizens advocacy group fighting for lower taxes, less waste, and more accountable government. The CTF has thousands of supporters here in Toronto and hundreds of thousands across the country. I come before you today to make a single request with regards to Toronto's 2021 budget. Instead of raising taxes, stop wasting taxpayers' money. Mayor John Tory was elected on a simple promise, and that was to keep property taxes at or below the rate of inflation. Well, inflation is 0.7% this year, but property taxes are increasing by 2.2% due to the city building levy. This broken promise is not only disappointing, it comes at the worst possible time. 
Toronto families and businesses are struggling. A property tax hike adds salt to the wound and shows Toronto politicians are out of touch with the struggles of Torontonians. In May, we called for Toronto City Councillors to take a pay cut to show solidarity with struggling taxpayers who pay your six-figure salary, as the City of Vancouver uh, did as well. While we were disappointed on that front in Toronto, we applaud the $573 million in savings and offsets that the City of Toronto found. But that's not nearly enough. Toronto's 2021 budget still contains an $856 million hole and it's irresponsible to rely on taxpayers outside of Toronto for bailouts. Reminder, the federal and Ontario governments are broke. Ontario's debt is approaching $400 billion this year, and the national debt has already surpassed a trillion dollars. Combined, each Ontarian's individual portion of the provincial and federal government's debt amounts to over $50,000 per person, Debt today means taxes tomorrow, which means Ontarians already have a $50,000 tax liability hanging over their head. Ultimately, there are three levels of government spending money, but there's only one taxpayer footing the bill for all of it. Again, I ask, instead of raising taxes, Toronto City Council must reduce its spending. Well, it's unfortunate that there are so many examples of Toronto City Council wasting taxpayers' money. Fortunately, that does mean that there are many opportunities to go further to find more savings instead of raising taxes. Let me name just a few. The City of Toronto is currently in a court battle to add 22 more politicians to payroll. Even after the number of City Councillors was reduced by 47%, total office and salary expenditures for Council as a whole increased by 14%. The city voted against opening construction contract bidding to non-unions, which could have saved up to 8% on construction costs or $48 million a year, and there's no plan to revisit uh, this decision in light of devastated finances. 375 employees of the City of Toronto received not one, but two taxpayer-funded pensions. The city has dumped tens of millions into Bike Share Toronto, which has lost money nearly every year, in fact, every year since it was transferred from Bixie to the Toronto Parking Authority in 2014. And this is while other Canadian cities have private, profitable bike share programs. The city of Toronto operates five golf courses that lose money year after year. They face declining usership and they still need millions worth of improvements to be paid for by taxpayers. Last but certainly not least, the Mayor of Toronto, John Tory, says he wants to proceed with Rail Deck Park, but the city's total cost estimate of $1.7 billion excludes various relevant costs, such as financing, which will inevitably drive up costs for taxpayers. These are just a few of the examples that show that the City of Toronto can go much further to find savings. We implore the City, we implore city Councillors to reduce spending by cutting waste instead of increasing the tax burden on struggling Torontonians at this time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jasmine. Are there questions? Councillor Carroll. Hi, Jasmine. It's uh, Councillor Carroll here. We, we've had a number of deputations um over the, the the last one two three four we're on our fifth session i think aren't we mr chair um and and their their main uh, suggestions were that we abandon the uh the gardener hybrid option and go to the boulevard option which would certainly bring a huge savings in construction costs and and debt because it's debt funded and that we cut the police budget by 50 percent. what are your uh, thoughts on that Look, uh, it really does come up to City Council to decide where they want to find savings. I've outlined a number of areas where there's just blatant waste. I don't think that anybody could argue that any of the examples that I listed here um, would be missed. Uh, for example, um, you know, some people rely on the gardener to get to work. Some people uh, would argue that maybe we do need police. I don't have an opinion on that either way. What I would say is why not start cutting costs um, where everybody can agree that there's just 
uh, simply waste going on. Um, and fortunately, in the city of Toronto, there are many, many examples uh, of that. So I would say, you know, start with the low-hanging fruit. Um, and Rail Deck Park for, is a perfect example um, because the $1.6 billion hole in the city's budget this year aligns almost perfectly with the $1.7 billion cost of the park. Um, so I would say start with the low-hanging fruit. I think there's no excuse to be spending that sort of money on another park when the city doesn't take care of the parks it currently has. So unfortunately, most of the decadents that have come don't, are, are not recognizing that as low hanging fruit because it's a future cost and they were looking at present costs because you seem to be concerned about debt. So I just wondered where you aligned with the opinion that is coming from so many people who have spoken to us. But, but if you don't want to weigh in on those, it's just in terms of listening to the public, that's what the public's been saying for, for, for most of the deputations we've heard uh, up until till, up until your own. Well, I would certainly, uh, you know, dispute the premise that uh, capital expenditure uh, is not part of the operating budget because part of the capital budget is funded by the operating budget. And as we know very well, uh, you know, there's only one source of funding for, um, for both the operating and capital budgets, and that's from taxpayers' pockets. So I think that uh, the city... Um, absolutely needs to find cost savings where it can. Uh, the city uh, uh, budget and finance uh, uh, clerk the other day, or not the clerk, uh, the department had contacted me to say that, um, for example, Rail Deck Park uh, has $2 million of funding allocated towards studying it next year. I wonder how much of that $2 million towards studying a new park could maybe fund operational pressures such as the lack of shelter space in Toronto right now. Um, so I think absolutely you need to look at the budgets holistically, uh, especially because capital funding, uh, some of it comes from the operating budget itself. Yep, absolutely. Thanks for coming. Great points. Thanks. My pleasure. Thank you. Um, any other questions? So just for just for a point of clarification, Jasmine, um, with regard to Rail Deck, you brought it up. Other than yes, there is uh, uh, some money in there for a study. But you are aware that there is no money in the 10 year capital plan for rail deck. It seems to be indicated a few times that um, we are spending money on rail deck. There is no money outside of the study. And I understand the concerns with that in our 10 year plan for rail deck. You just want to make sure you're aware of that. Uh, I was aware and I find that even uh, more worrisome uh, because the mayor confirmed last summer, I believe it was in June that the city is uh, proceeding with this. Uh, reckless pet project of his. Uh, and so the fact that there's no money, uh, no funding certainly allocated for it, I think is even more worrisome to taxpayers um, because that just means that you know, it's almost like buying a house without a down payment. You have to have 5% down on a on a, even a not high quality house in this country to buy it. Um, but the city of Toronto, the mayor has confirmed that he wants to go ahead with this uh, reckless multi-billion dollar park yet he doesn't have even 0.1% of the funding for it. So uh, respectfully, this is very worrisome for taxpayers. Um, it's not a relief to learn that there's no budget, budget uh, funding set aside for it. It's more of a liability. Okay, thank you. Appreciate your opinion. Um, any other questions? Seeing none, let's move to the next. Uh, Susan McMurray. Susan McMurray, Toronto and York Region Labour Council. Susan Murray. Okay, so Susan, you there now? So again, so we may have uh, Susan. If you do hear us or hear me, just try to reach out to uh, Clarks, and we'll try to get you on later. Can you hear me now? Oh yes, now we can. Perfect. Okay, thanks very much. Go okay, <clears throat> so uh, my name is Susan McMurray. I'm executive. Uh, I was going to say executive director. I'm executive assistant at Toronto and York Region Labor Council. And I'd like to thank the members of Toronto's Budget Committee for the opportunity to speak today. Many Torontonians, including over 200,000 of our members, hope that the 2021 budget your committee recommends looks substantially different than what was released to the public on January 14th. Last year, Toronto's labour community met with the mayor, with other councillors, and in externally organized COVID recovery tables to provide our best advice about what should be done in the short and longer run 
to address the impact of COVID-19 at the municipal level. And we also joined with other organizations. Many sound recommendations were provided to the Toronto Office of Recovery and Rebuild. And in the short run, the city stepped up, demonstrating social solidarity with communities and pressing other levels of government to do more. Thank you for this. Unfortunately, the proposed budget doesn't ensure the implementation of that same approach. In fact, it feels a, a little like shopping for fast fashion, which is cheap, temporarily trendy and disposable. Fast fashion looks good at first glance, but the poor quality and cheapness is apparent to discerning people. And this budget feels dressed up in nice words, but as is, is not gonna give us anything sustainable. Instead, uh, the Labour Council calls on the Budget Committee to propose the following, especially given that we are in a serious crisis and there are deep fiscal capacity, especially at the federal level. Um, I'll summarize and then give a few details. Fully fund Toronto's response to COVID, including addressing the racial and social economic inequities that are exposed and exacerbated by COVID. Deliver quality services, quality public services by budgeting for and maintaining adequate staffing levels. Address the climate emergency now. Reallocate police budgets so the right resources and services are dedicated to community safety. Maintain a focused capital budget. Assume that revenues to fill budget gaps will be forthcoming from federal and provincial governments and prepare for a just green recovery for all. As Martin Luther King said, the time is always right to do the right thing. So more details are provided in a submission I sent to you earlier today, and many others will speak to these issues in further detail. And here is just a, a couple of supporting points. Spending less than 22 million for new equity and reconciliation programs and adding a little funding to existing programs is clearly inadequate to address the scale of the problems we all know exist. Others will talk more about that issue and already have. Secondly, allowing de facto staff reductions by built-in delays filling vacant positions, including gapping, means quality services and programs can't actually be delivered. Third, aside from the 1.7 million targeting a pilot project for crisis response, there's been no attempt to reallocate police budgets and hire civilian workers this year, as Torontonians expect. It's clear by observing harmful policing of people experiencing mental health crises, the over-policing of Black, Indigenous, and racialized youth, or addressing homelessness through policing that the current model is problematic. Next, Transform TO should be a huge priority, yet we see a 33% cut in the, the, the real budget for environment and energy. We can't lose any more time in tackling the climate crisis. Coming to the end, we need to retain capital funding for new infrastructure projects, for retrofitting and other enhancements, and just for state of good repair. As many commentators are pointing out, there are precedents for passing budgets with assumed revenues. The budget should assume provincial and federal revenues will be available to fill the projected 856 million budget hole, as well as to address the other COVID highlighted and exacerbated inequities. Finally, City Council uh, and Budget Committee, please keep the future in mind. We need to prepare for ambitious thinking to help put Toronto back on track to be the great city that it can uh, return to being. We will want to use a broader range of revenue tools to negotiate for a new deal for cities and to work for a just green recovery for all as we come out of the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Questions? Seeing none, next is Jennifer Chambers. Jennifer Chambers. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, Jennifer. Oh, Go ahead. Oh, good. Uh, I just have to turn off the computer. Can I get the feedback right now? <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to leave the area. Okay. The Empowerment Council. Oh. The Empowerment Council is an organization that represents people with lived experience of mental health and substance use issues. Empowerment Council policy and positions are directly, directed entirely by this community. I'm also a property owner, and if you're a budget committee, I want you to know that I favor a property tax increase. Our city is not a don't pay a cent event. 
Everyone has to contribute to the privilege of living in this beautiful place, rich with a diversity of people. We're all Toronto, not just some of us, and we need to take care of each other. It's cheaper and more humane to house a person and to keep them in a shelter. It saves money and lives to provide harm reduction services rather than imprison people for drug use. Care-run community-based services are not only preferred by most people in crisis to coercive services, but they also save millions of dollars. The way money is being spent in this city, province, and country makes no sense in human or economic terms. I'm going to talk to you today primarily about the crisis, the alternative to police crisis model that's been developed. It's been moving to hear so many Torontonians care about people in crisis. They do not, however, really understand how to care. This is understandable as people with mental health issues are so discriminated against, it's not even noticed when this voice gets short shrift, even when decisions being made are 100% about the same community. There's a reason that the disability community has the slogan, nothing about us without us. Simply adding traditional mental health services into the mix of crisis response will not necessarily prevent use of force or save lives where lives are often lost. In fact, currently 30% of calls to 911 are from service providers. 22,000 calls come from came from paramedics last year. The additional mental health services are often coercive, and mental health facilities, not just police, use force and they use it with anti-black bias. We need to create something different, and that can only be done if the people who are going to be most impacted, people whose lives are on the line, are in charge, people who are black, people who are indigenous, and people with personal experience of a crisis. Frankly, the degree to which the community of people with mental health and addiction issues have not been mentioned in the proposed service governance and delivery of the community crisis pilot report is discriminatory. I understand that intentions were good, but this is why organizations representing people with lived experience have to be involved at every stage. Notice I say organizations. Just like random community members and not place on communities to represent other communities, this should not happen with representation in people with lived experience. A crisis service that leans primarily on police and hospitals is the most expensive and coercive of crisis systems. It is what most service users, people with lived experience, least want. Everything good about an alternative depends on who and how. When deciding where to allocate social spending and mental health dollars, consider this. Chandra has been internationally esteemed for its comprehensive network of ser service user, people with lived experience run organizations. Studies were conducted that found peer-run services save millions that could be otherwise have been spent on days in hospital. But many such organizations have been lost through funding cuts and requirements to merge with traditional mental health services, and new models of peer services that are successful elsewhere have not been resourced here. Other places in the world have learned from Toronto and now surpass it. There are peer respite centers in many cities that provide a successful alternative to hospitalization for some people. They provide a more comprehensive long-term response to crises than emergency services can, have been found to provide more lasting benefit than hospitalization. Cost-effective and lasting solutions leave people empowered and with their dignity intact, but also save Toronto money in emergency services. A crisis response model, even a great one, is going to fall short as nowhere for people in crisis to recover. A peer respite centre is an ideal option. Money could come from reassigning police functions that could be delivered as well or better by others for less cost. You have many such reports. So when you consider reallocating, or when you consider allocating resources to mental health supports and alternatives to policing, remember that the nature of these alternatives matter. Look to peer-run services as models for the governance and service delivery of these alternatives. Look also to service providers like Gerstein who value lived experience in every aspect of their service delivery and governance. Not only are there better long-term benefits and services that empower, also more cost-effective. Don't let the pursuit of new solutions proceed along the path of the last two decades. One of support and development of only the most coercive and expensive of mental health services because prejudice favors controlling people in crisis rather than helping people in crisis. Thank you for hearing us today. Thank you very much. Any questions? Great. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Uh, next three speakers will be Sadie Epstein Fine, Astrid Markich, uh, and Nicholas Agarwal. Sadie? Epstein, fine, you can go. Yep, I'm here. Great, thanks, Sadie. Your turn. Five minutes. Hello. Okay. Uh, hi, everybody. Council members, Mayor Tory, my fellow deputers, and community members. I want to thank Susan and Jennifer who deputed before me. Clearly, I am in very good company. My name is Sadie. I've lived in Toronto my entire life. I grew, I grew up in Ward 12, and now I live in Ward 14. 
I grew up with two moms and I also identify as queer. I work as a theater artist. I'm speaking today, as you have heard from so many others, to demand that you decrease the Toronto police budget by at least 50%. For those of you on council who do not believe in decreasing the police budget, I urge you not to tune out this argument, but to understand that of all the people who have deputed over the last two days, as Councillor Carroll just pointed out, this issue has been the overwhelming reason why people have been calling in. Beyond these deputations, I know that you have received thousands of calls and emails demanding this 50% reduction. These are the people you represent and we deserve to be listened to. I could make many recommendations as to where the funds from the police budget could go. You have heard so many excellent recommendations of where to invest money in over the last two days, including shelters, supportive housing, the climate, gardening, mental health support, the arts. Would I love to see more arts funding as a theater artist? Of course I would. The arts is so underfunded in this city, as well as the province and country, it's laughable. If you're worried about police officers losing their jobs because of defunding, you should talk to me and my colleagues who are constantly facing unemployment and precarity, never knowing where our next paycheck is going to come from. Talk to any of my friends in social services where programs are always being cut and jobs lost. Why do you care more about the livelihood of police officers who harm our communities than people who are working tirelessly to make them better? However, I'm not going to make any recommendations for where the police budget should be reallocated to because I shouldn't have to. It should be enough that the TPS regularly harms and kills residents of your city for no other reason than upholding and maintaining white supremacy. Do you need to hear the statistics again? You know that Black, Indigenous, racialized, queer, trans, mad, disabled, and homeless people are disproportionately harmed by police. Why aren't you doing anything? A 0% increase is not doing anything. It's insulting. Equity and diversity training clearly doesn't help. Body cameras increase the, the police budget and increase violence. Coco, a Black trans woman who was one of the latest victims of police violence, was murdered while she was in police custody. I did not personally know Coco, but she was a member of my larger queer and trans community. I cannot bear to watch one more member of my community die at the hands of the police. These systems are not new. I grew up in queer community. My older brother recalls being at marches and knowing as a child that police were not there to protect him or his family. When members of the queer, commun of, of the queer community told police that someone was murdering queer men, they were dismissed allowing serial killer Bruce MacArthur to murder many, mostly racialized men. Nothing has changed. You have the power to decrease the scope of police and reallocate that funding into services that actually make our community safer. People experiencing mental health distress should not have to encounter police. Homeless people should not have to encounter police when they are just seeking shelter. People who cannot afford to ride the TTC should not encounter police when they cannot pay. They should just be able to get to their destination. At the end of last year, I received Councillor Fletcher's email about how the East End stood up to anti-Black racism after the incident at Michael Guerin Hospital. This is a similar sentiment I've heard across the board from council members and Mayor Tory. While it was so wonderful to see the community response that came as a result of that incident, that cannot be where you stop. It is not enough to just post pictures of the messages of love and support. Council members, Mayor Tory, if you say you are committed to fighting anti-Black racism, you must actually listen to Black communities. At this point, not acting on community recommendations is a deliberate choice. It's a choice that tells the people you represent that you do not represent them. You must defund the Toronto police, the police by 50%. People's lives depend on it. That is it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Questions? Thank you very much, Sadie. Next is Astrid Merkich. Astrid Merkich. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. Um, so my name is Astrid. I'm a lawyer. I've lived in Toronto for 11 years, and I'm currently a resident of Warren 10. I am here today, uh, or on the phone, I guess, to um, talk to you about defunding the Toronto Police, something that um, 
so many others before me have have been speaking about. So I've been listening and watching the deputations over the past two days, uh, where so many individuals and groups have spoken on the need for Toronto City Council to defund the TPS and reallocate funds to community programs. I've also seen the dread and reticence on your faces as you're forced to hear speaker after speaker tell you what we all already know, which is that the TPS is overfunded, they commit harm against many of Toronto's communities, and that our city and its people are in crisis and in dire need of community services that are underfunded. I point this out to you because I fear that after two days of hearing this, you may be suffering from defund the police fatigue and that you might be tempted to tune out from what you see as a small group of quote, radicalized activists. And I want to implore you to keep listening. The movement to defund the police is not a fringe movement. It is now mainstream. In Ipsos poll commissioned by Global News in the summer of 2020 found that 51% of Canadians at large support the idea of defunding the police. And there is no indication of support for the movement decreasing, especially considering uh, that support for it among younger generations is at over 65%. The issue and our demands to defund the police are not going to go away. And so I encourage you to take real consideration of what is being argued and asked of you today. What I'm so concerned with and disappointed by is the city's commitment to the status quo regarding addressing community safety vis-a-vis -vis the police and police funding. The way that I think about the city's approach is what would you think of a doctor who continues the same treatment regimen for a patient where that treatment has pro proved ineffective? If this were you or your family member, you would call them a bad doctor. You would even maybe call their medical competency into question. So why is the approach the city is taking to community safety and policing the same as it's been when year after year we see that it doesn't work. There is no limit to the statistics and documentary evidence that supports that policing has actually deepened systemic injustices, harmed Black, racialized, and Indigenous communities, and failed to achieve its stated goal. And that in a broad range of settings, policing is the wrong tool for improving safety, as it often has the opposite effect. So why? With this information at our disposal, is the city still taking the same approach to safety? The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over and expecting different results. And what the city is doing, or rather failing to do, is insane. I'm calling on you to divest from the police and to reinvest that money in the people of Toronto. Imagine what half of the Toronto police budget, $540 million, could do for the services that all of you care about and have been trying to champion for the residents of your wards. I think about what half a billion dollars could accomplish for affordable housing in a city where the underhoused feel safer living in encampments than in city shelters, and where I, as an educated and employed lawyer who routine, routinely appears before the Federal Court of Canada can no longer afford to rent an apartment in downtown Toronto. What this pandemic has made egregiously clear to me is that our city doesn't value the lives of vulnerable and impo impoverished people. We strip those people experiencing poverty or mental health issues of dignity. And as someone who lives across the street from Trinity Bellwoods, I see every day that wealthy homeowners don't want to be burdened with the unsightly picture of poverty in front of their multi-million dollar homes. And so they call on the police to clear out what they see as the refuse of their beloved hipster yuppie park that sits upon stolen indigenous land and the city lets them do this because the value of property is more than the value of people we have to do better than this
in a city that so often loves to tout its diversity as a selling point, when it really comes down to it, not only does the city not stand by or support the people who make Toronto diverse, but it keeps funding the very institution that actively does harm to our, to our diverse communities. You'll so have to wrap up, please. Yeah, in closing, to the councillors that present themselves as progressive, I'm appealing to your morality and ethics. You know that the TPS is a problem, so do something about it. Don't tell us there's nothing you can be done, because if you truly believe that, you shouldn't be on city council, because if you're not willing to listen to the people you represent, you're no longer doing the job that you've been elected to do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Astrid. Questions? Next, uh, Nicholas Agarwal. Nicholas, are you there? Hi, can you hear me? We can. You have five minutes. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, so, hello, city councillors and staff. Uh, my name is Nicholas Agarwal. Um, my, heart, my heart is racing. And I'm nervous, but I'm here today because this is important to me. I live in Ward 12 and have lived here my whole life. Um, and unlike our first speaker, I'm not being paid to be here. This is my first time speaking to you. I'm 25 years old. And when my parents came to Canada in 1994, they settled in this area because it was an affordable uh, place for new immigrants to move to and to start a family. I have grown up here my entire life. My brother was born upstairs from where I am now speaking to you, and my friends live within a 15 minute walk in every direction. This is my home and community. Growing up in Canada, we're told that every day is another day in the march towards progress to a better city and country. I have seen the garbage dump behind my house turn into a park and our waterfront revitalized. But I have also seen the population of people who go unhoused rise beyond what was once imaginable. I have seen my friends move out of the city and I have seen their house be demolished for investment properties. This has made me very scared for my future as it seems that there is no place for me or for anyone who has grown up here. I felt alone in this feeling until I heard all the deputations today and this week. I am not alone in this struggle, and this makes me feel more powerful than ever. Young people, we make up the city. We use the library that's closed for more than it's open. We go to the school with leaky roofs, and we take the TDC that feels like it's about to fall apart every day. We know the city and its issues. We see our friends get racially profiled and stopped by the police for walking down the street. And we see how poor and, homeless and the homeless are victimized by the police more than a serial murderer ever was in the gay village. We see all of this and we see your inaction. This is the city you claim to represent. With the death of George Floyd and Regis Kuczynski Paquette, a global call to defund the police has emerged. And I know you've heard, you've heard this already today, but I, also, but I wanna um, um, emphasize and say that how will you respond to this moment and movement that is a ca calling upon us all together? I am here to echo the demands of Black Lives Matter Toronto to defund the police uh, services budget in 2021 by 50% and reallocate that 50% of funding to meet community needs and strengthen public services for marginalized communities, Black, Indigenous, racialized and poor, low income and low income folks. You may say that it is impossible, that it is not within your power as a city, but these are unprecedented times and we're calling on you to try harder and fight for your home. So I'm call calling upon you specifically, Shelley Carroll, Brad Bradford, Jennifer McKelvey and Mike Layton and asking, who do you serve and who do you represent? Do you serve the small elite interests of the ultra rich and the police unions? I'm using quotes here. Or do you represent the interest of the majority of Torontonians that agree that defunding the police is the safe and practical thing to do? Will you step up to your responsibilities, be bold and join our side? The choice is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing oh, Councillor Layton, you had a question. I'll just uh, j just add to, to that final point. Are you aware that uh, the police union has twice gone after me, both uh, uh, recently, both Councillor Wong Tam and I, for uh, some recent comments about in, uh, the movement towards defund, as well as a couple of years ago, uh, the, the police uh, union president had some choice words. Uh, and uh, I, I tell you to Google them, but it's not appropriate to actually say them uh, on uh, on a live stream. So certainly not, sir, do I in any way represent the interest of the police services board over that of my community. 
That's great to hear. Thanks, uh, Councillor Layton, and I hope your colleagues will also stand with you. Councillor Carroll, question? Yeah, I'm just interested when you, you named names, why you didn't name every member of this committee? Uh, I named I named the four of you because I be, um, because I believe that you all um, claim to have progressive or kind of um, views that represent their community, and I and I really want to hold you and uh, hope that you can stand into that into that into those claims. Absolutely, but but uh, uh, to to get to something that that actually can happen, you understand that we have to find a consensus in a council that is 25 members and the mayor. Mm -hmm. Yes, I understand. I think there's enough councillors that uh, if you all, if you four can really advocate and speak out, I, I think that you can do it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Nicholas. Next is Katia or Katia Mokdad from Progress Toronto. Hi there. Uh, my name is Katia and I'm here speaking on behalf of Progress Toronto. I'm a young person. I just recently graduated university and this is my first deputation, but certainly not my last. Um, unprecedented seemed to be the word of 2020. Um, we heard it over and over again as we watched a pandemic sweep every corner of the world. We saw small businesses plummet, working class jobs disappear and daycare centers close indefinitely. Some of us were lucky enough to only lose our jobs while others lost neighbors, coworkers and loved ones. 2021 was supposed to be the year where we finally met unprecedented times with unprecedented action and demonstrated our dedication to strengthening struggling communities who, as instructed by the government, patiently weathered the storm, hopeful that by the end of it, relief would come. In my opinion, the 2021 budget put forward by the city does not provide the relief that so many of us are counting on. Amidst the pandemic, fiscal crises and climate emergency, Community supports and services are being underfunded or in some cases ignored entirely. I believe that our right to affordable housing, well-funded transit and accessible childcare should be a guarantee rather than a privilege provided only when the numbers allow for it. Deputies from all over the city are here today because we believe your allegiance to the bureaucratic status quo should not outweigh the long-term well-being of Toronto's most vulnerable communities. Now, I know that Mayor John Tory himself has acknowledged that housing people temporarily in shelters is actually more expensive for the city than funding and building out permanent solutions. If that's true, why has there been no efforts made to appoint a housing commissioner whose entire role consists of making sure the city is taking concrete actions to combat systematic housing discrimination? Why do shelters continue to be chronically underfunded and overcrowded? Why must food banks rely on everyday citizens and corporate marketing budgets rather than effective and meaningful public policy? In the face of our demands, you might argue that you simply do not have the money. And I get it. I mean, with COVID, coupled with the deplorable state of intergovernmental affairs on top of one of the lowest property tax rates for millionaires in the region, I can imagine times are very tough at City Hall. In that case, may I suggest turning your attention to the $1 billion in funding allocated to police in 2021. I can't help but wonder why the Toronto police budget has such an untouchable status when time and time again, the police have shown our communities that they cannot be trusted as first responders. What kind of values does our city demonstrate when an officer's first instinct upon interacting with someone living in a tent is to confiscate their survival equipment and issue them a ticket? Criminalizing poverty is not an example of a municipal revenue tool. A vehicle registration tax, a vacant homes tax, a mansion land transfer tax, and a commercial parking levy are examples of these revenue tools. We urge you to explore these options as forward-thinking councillors in Vancouver already have in order to generate additional revenue streams for the city. City Council members, how many special reports on the disparities in police treatment of racial minorities must we commission before it becomes clear that the only way forward is to be bold, to be innovative, to be unrelenting in our commitment to divest funds from police and divert them to community-based anti-violence and public safety initiatives? Because we know that more appropriate interventions are available at a lower cost with better outcomes when we send support workers to address issues with vulnerable people instead of police. Defund the police is not a phase, it's not a trend, and it will not go away. As people grow more informed and mobilized on the realities of policing in Toronto, I promise you the calls to heed our demands will only grow louder. I believe you're all very smart, accomplished, and powerful people. And so I urge you to lead with the power of your example. 
set a precedent and do what's right. Divest from police and invest in the future of Toronto 2021 and beyond. Thanks for your time. Hey, Katya. Seeing no questions, uh, next three speakers, Don Booth, Ann Kiri, and Seda Azra Naz. So Don, are you connected, hopefully? Don Booth? Don, if you are there and if you can hear us, um, call back or we'll try to work in getting you uh, connected shortly. Anne Kiri. Uh, hi. Uh, Don Booth is here. Oh, Don is here. Okay. Then Don, you're up. Go for it. I'm all thumbs when it comes to a computer. I've only been using them for 20 or 30 years. Yeah, welcome to our world. <laughs> uh, Councillor Crawford. Members of the committee, thank you for allowing me to make this deputation. I'd like to speak with you about the cost of retrofitting Toronto's buildings, and I'd like to propose a solution. This deputation is an expanded version of the deputation I made to the executive committee meeting of October 21st on recovery and building a new Toronto. I'd also like to thank the Toronto East End Climate Collective and the Toronto Climate Action Network, which gave rise to this solution. I went to one of the meetings by accident. <clears throat> um, we know that buildings account for 52% of the city's greenhouse gas emissions. We know that retrofits required will create lots of jobs and reduce lots of greenhouse gas emissions. And we also know that these retrofit, retrofits will cost lots of money that the city doesn't have. However, the City of Toronto owns Toronto Hydro, which regularly issues bonds to pay for the city's energy. Toronto Hydro can raise the money we need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions through its regular bond offerings. I suggest that Toronto Hydro increase the size of its bonds to help cover two significant budget items. One, loans to homeowners and landlords <clears throat> via the Home Energy Loan Program or HELP, and two, loans to the Toronto City Housing Corporation, um, the question then becomes how to pay it back. And the answer is on bill finance. It's relatively simple. Toronto Hydro pays for the retrofit. Customers repay Toronto Hydro through their monthly bills. After the loan is repaid, customers' bills will be lower than they are today. In either case, Toronto Hydro's ability uh, to borrow tranches of funds will take the pressure off of the city's budget. Perhaps equally important, the on-bill finance mechanism demonstrates that the city has shouldered our portion of costs, making it more difficult for Queens Park or Ottawa to shy away from their commitments. Uh, stepping lightly into the weeds, place where I'm far from an expert, Toronto Hydro bond issues range between 200 million and 300 million dollars and are repaid over a 10 year period. And I should add that they, <clears throat> they do about one issue a year. The HELP program currently received $15 million from the Federation of, of Canadian Municipalities, and that money is spread over three or four years. Perhaps Toronto Hydro could increase each bond offering by $50 million and share the additional funds equally between TCHC and the HELP program. TCHC receives $150 million each year over nine years from the National Co-Investment Fund for Upgrades and Repairs. This comes to $150 million per year, round figures. The program will yield a cost savings of 10% and a 9% reduction in greenhouse gases. An investment of $25 million should then pay back in about 10 years via savings. On the residential side of things, a light retrofit typically yields 10, 20% energy savings and payback in about five years. My inexpert figures see that the 10 year bond, that the 10 year bond should be repaid in good time. But there's an important side note on the residential side. I restricted my figures to light retrofits to keep the cost low under $5,000. 
At this figure, it should be easy to treat these costs much like a water heater or a furnace rentals that many pay on their hydro bill already. In other words, there's no need to apply for a loan. If you can afford to pay your hydro bill, you can afford this light retrofit. Current programs require the inconvenience of a loan application, along with the associated impact of a person's um, on a person's ability to borrow for other things. Medium retrofits have energy savings about 29% and deep retrofits easily save 75% or more. The higher cost of these more aggressive retrofits currently requires a more traditional loan. I would be remiss if I did, did not acknowledge um, that the plan relies on the participation and foresight of Toronto Hydro's board of directors. I do not have this. Sorry? You'll just have to wrap up. It's at five minutes. Okay. Um, I don't have the foresight to um, see the significant number of. Sorry, um, I lost my place. I don't have the means to calculate the impact of the energy savings on Toronto Hydro's operations because it will see a number of buildings migrate from gas to electric. But on the financial side, in asking Toronto Hydro to take on a major role in conserving energy rather than just producing it, I'm not suggesting that they go out on a limb. I'm only asking that Hydro implement tried and true programs, some of which have been successfully operating for decades in jurisdictions as diverse as <coughs> Manitoba, Tennessee, thanks, and thanks. California. Thank you. Thank you. I think, uh, Councillor Layton, did you have a question? Yes, thanks. Hi, Don. Uh, just, I'm going to ask you as a, did you know that uh, based on a motion from City Council, there will be a report back, I believe, to the Executive Committee in the coming months on how we could expand the role of Toronto Hydro in delivering energy efficiency programs. Whoopee. That's my That's so great. you'll get a chance. Know. You'll get a chance to use some of your inexpert advice uh, with them as well. Um, but you're you're going along the lines of I think where generally speaking um, the uh, uh, there, there's a lot of expert advice being given to uh, uh, Toronto Hydro and the city manager along those lines. The second point um, uh, had to do with, uh, you know what? I totally forgot my second question. So I'll just, I'll <laughs> shut up now. Thank uh, you. Carol, did you have a question? Well, just, it, it's actually very similar to, to what Councillor Layton was saying. Um, Don, you, you might be, you might put the tower wise program over at Toronto atmosphere fund out of business with this. Uh, but uh, but they'd happy they'd be happy to be out of business if every cement slab apartment building was retrofitted and why can't we put them all together? Suit. Yeah. Why can't we mush them all together? Yes, yes. So so your plan, which if we would only use creative financing, we would get to the point where that impediment, which is to say to people, go out and go through the ordeal of getting a loan at a financial institution. You're just saying pile it into the very place they go to pay their bill, their energy bill, and and put the financing in there. And we do it on the basis of their they're a customer in good standing, whether they're a single family dweller or a, could they be an apartment building owner as well in your model, do you think? It, um, com commercial real estate is a different kettle of fish. I mean, they get a hydro bill and they pay it. Yeah. So, um, a you huge know what? I, I, yeah, I, but they don't, I, I can't answer that question. I don't know. And it might depend very much on, well, what's the impact on their bill? Um, if you amortize, if you have a 10 year amortization of the loan, um, is that going to end up with a bill that's roughly the same as it is now? If right. roughly that's the case, then we're okay. And may, maybe, maybe they don't have to go through the whole Michigas of, uh, uh, yeah, talking yeah. to bankers. Right, and what you're saying is is um, uh, use our ability to 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 use any kind of creative financing model. We do now. Uh, that that giant courthouse that's looking beautiful and going up behind City Hall was done with very creative financing out of need because we we desperately needed that. Mm -hmm. But in order to do it, we looked at very creative uh, financing and bond issuing and, and, and a new use to the sinking fund, such as you're, you're describing here. It's not, you're, you're asking us to do something that we've done before, but 
for energy. Yeah, and Basically what, what I'm saying. suggesting is real old, decades and yeah. decades, maybe a century old. It's it's nothing new. Yeah, there, there, yes. there are a couple of things that um, tricks to doing it well, like anything, but it's not yeah. a new idea. Exactly. It's a good Thank idea. you so much. Thanks. Thanks for making us think this afternoon. <laughs> oh, it's my pleasure, and I'll look out for uh, the executive committee, and and I'll help them out there. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Donna. Thank I appreciate very much. your help and support. Um, next, Ann Curie. Ann, are you there? I am. Hello. Great. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to depute today. Um, my name is Anne Keary. I'm an independent scholar, a parent, and an advocate for climate justice with two groups here in Toronto, Climate Fast and For Our Kids, the latter being a group of parents and caregivers who are desperately concerned about what the unravelling climate crisis will mean for our children's future and the futures of all children. I am also, like so many in this city, originally from another country, Australia. I mention this because Toronto likes to boast of its status as a world city, a city with an international population and a city with international standing. And because I would like to remind the committee that Toronto is a member of the C40 Cities, an international coalition of cities committed to bold climate action. And further, that our mayor, John Tory, joined the C40 Cities Global Mayor's COVID-19 Recovery Task Force, and in so doing, committed to pursuing a recovery guided by a number of principles, including that, quote, the recovery should not be a return to business as usual, because that is a world on track for three degrees or more of overheating. In other words, catastrophic warming this century. That quote, the recovery be guided by an adherence to public health and scientific expertise in order to assure the safety of those who live in our cities. That the recovery must address issues of equity that have been laid bare by the impact of the crisis. And that the recovery must improve the resilience of our cities and communities. Therefore, investments should be made to protect against future threats, including the climate crisis. So I am asking, is Toronto seriously committed to these principles? Are we committed to joining other world cities and building back better in a post-pandemic world? Because if we are, we need to be doing all we can to address economic inequities, racial justice, and the threats posed by the climate crisis. This means not cutting services, it means raising funds, and it means serious investments in building an equitable, low carbon city for the sake of all our children. Toronto has taken a big financial hit as a result of the pandemic, but instead of reducing spending, the city must both advocate for funds from the federal and provincial governments and look to other ways of raising funds. How to do this? One, in line with our C40 commitments to addressing equity and building resilience, raise the property tax increase above the current minimal 0.7% and invest the funds raised in the services needed by residents who have been most impacted by the pandemic, many of whom are renters, many of whom are frontline workers in racialized and low income communities. Toronto has one of the lowest property taxes in the province. Lift the raise to at least 1.7%. I'm a property owner, raise my taxes. Two, reinstate the vehicle registration tax. Again, this would be in keeping with our C40 commitments to equity. For the most part, those who drive cars have higher incomes than those who take transit or ride bikes. And it would be in keeping with our C40 commitment to addressing the climate crisis. Direct the funds toward expanding, expanding cycling infrastructure and improving, improving public transit. The city should also reallocate funds. As a matter of equity and racial justice, I strongly support calls to defund the police by 50%. The current proposal to reallocate only 1.7 million of the 1.2 billion police budget is not nearly enough. Reallocate we need to reallocate millions more to community health and housing services, particularly for black, indigenous, racialized, low income and homeless residents who are most harmed by over policing. I also strongly support calls for the city to reconsider its current plan to spend 40% of its 10-year transportation, 
capital budget on rebuilding the Gardner Expressway, 2.2 billion. Such a plan runs directly counter to our C40 commitment to building back better and planning for our low carbon future. Other C40 cities are taking action to reduce car use and promote walking, cycling and public transit. Toronto should follow suit. And here I would like to give a shout out for city support for the proposed Greenway Conservancy project in Northwest Toronto and the University Avenue project. I have to wrap up, please. Sure. Lastly, remember that Toronto is indeed an international city. Don't ignore our human capital. There are so many in this city who bring knowledge from other countries and who are eager to work on climate solutions. Support that energy. Um, I'll skip to the end. To conclude, I urge the members of this committee to be bold, um, to remind the mayor of the principles of the Global Mayor's Recovery Task Force. Don't return to business as usual and look to creating a vibrant, equitable, low carbon city in which all our children can survive and thrive. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll have Saida Azra Naz. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, I am Sayeda Astranaz, a resident of Scarborough Centre in the Dorset Park community. Thank you for allowing me this opportunity to tell you my story and the struggles I had and continue to have with finding safe, affordable housing. Four years ago, I made a very difficult personal decision that was necessary and suddenly became a single parent with two children, no employment, no support, and very little saving. My options were limited and I sought help from Toronto Social Services. I was given childcare support and a $600 housing stipend through Ontario Works. I was temporarily staying with a friend and was close to being homeless. It was a difficult time. Looking for an affordable, safe place with no employment letter was next to impossible. I was told that though I qualified for Toronto Community Housing, the wait was 18 years and the shelters are up to, up to capacity. Luckily, with the help from a friend who gave me a part-time job, I was eventually able to secure a one-bedroom apartment in a market rental building close to my workplace. The part-time job pays me $800 a month and gives me flexibility to be home with my children when I need to. However, earning this income meant that my housing stipend from OW was reduced to $300. Four years ago, I was paying $900 a month for rent. This year, my rent is $1,067. I use the child benefit and the food stipend from OW to keep my children fed and clothed. I don't know how much longer I can maintain this. Added to this worry is the fact that despite the rental increases, I experience constant issues with building standards such as pest control, apartment repairs, and almost weekly broken elevators. An example of this is the year I moved in was the year the building got a hallway carpet change, which I, my neighbors told me was up almost after 10 to 12 years. And the fact that there hasn't been any duct cleaning since I moved in. A few incidents that happened in the past four years have also made me feel unsafe and the more security in the building has, needs to happen. COVID, as you know, has made things worse for everyone in my position as we have no other place to go. I also know that there are apartments sitting empty in the community housing building beside me for months and wonder why. When there is an 18 year wait list, families aren't being moved in quicker. Despite all the above and the additional stresses of virtual classes, I am grateful to have two wonderful children who have grown up so quickly, but are compassionate and loving. I'm grateful for the social supports I receive for childcare, employment training, housing, and child benefits. Without them, I would have, uh, I would have possibly been on the streets and my children removed from my care these past four years. So what am I asking you to consider in the city budget? I'm asking you to maintain the services and supports you currently have for tenants in market rental housing and increase the supply of subsidized and affordable housing in Scarborough. I'm asking that you do so now before me and my children and others like me are taken away from what little we already are holding on to. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Saida. Seeing no thank questions, um, the next three uh, speakers are Colleen Lynch, Leah Yuitung, and Elizabeth Bala. Colleen Lynch.
you're up. Can you hear me? We can hear you great. Go ahead. <laughs> great. Thank you for the opportunity to speak and a big thank you to the previous speakers. I'm hoping that my um, deputation underlines many of the important things that you've already mentioned. Um, this is my third deputation um, as a citizen of York South Weston, and this one seems to be all about the C words. My first two deputations were in support of Toronto's climate plan, Transform TO, and climate related initiatives in Toronto. This one is as well. We are now experiencing another crisis, though, COVID, and it shows us that people's health and well being must come first. It shows that communities with a strong social infrastructure are essential to face both ongoing crises and those that are sure to come. I'd like to suggest that although we face more than one crisis, biodiversity, climate, social health, they are connected. The roots of the crises are similar. Imbalance and inequity, the impacts are the same, precariousness, vulnerability, threats to health and well-being, and the solutions can be connected too. In fact, they must be. A climate health and equity lens needs to be applied in all budget decisions. And I'm very happy the Council has signed on to the C40 Green and Just Recovery and declared a climate emergency. Um, choices that move mandates like the Ravine Strategy, which supports green infrastructure and nature-based solutions, poverty reduction, and Toronto's Climate Action Plan Forward are critical, and they must not be delayed. I know it's a difficult time. It's a time for courage, not cuts. This means acting on C40 promises for a just green recovery. It means not de delaying implementation of Transform TO and the strategy to reach net zero emissions. And I urge you to, at minimum, put, put all of the money originally planned back into the environment and energy budget. Um, in fact, they could use more. <laughs> and I also ask that you move forward on a dedicated fund and maybe expanding bond program. It is a difficult time. It's a creativity. Funds spent repairing infrastructure like the gardener could be applied to good green jobs instead to a just transition and the shift to clean energy, public transit, and 15-minute cities that are central to C40 promises. A parking levy and a VRT could also help with this shift. And the C40 promises of green stimuli and an end to fossil fuel investment and subsidies are a powerful complement to these potential measures. I am a property owner. And I believe increased property tax paired with deferrals and cancellations for those who are actually strugg struggling could contribute to equity, freeing up mo money for strengthening communities and mitigating climate change. Toronto's buildings are the biggest source of emissions and our historic home is one of the culprits. A retrofit plan that makes it possible for everyone to get to net zero is essential. And perhaps the property tax could help with that. Um, defunding the police is also critical as you've heard from many people. I find it upsetting that a large percentage of our property tax currently goes to the police budget. And instead, these funds could be shifted to community-led services and programs that address inequity and truly protect people's health and well-being. To end, I'm confident that Council can move ahead in a positive way with both courage and creativity, helping us all face a future that is uncertain, but that can be much better if we prioritize what we must, biodiversity, equity, climate, health, and ensure actions that safeguard people and the planet. Thank you. Thank you very much, Colleen. Questions? Excellent. Uh, next is Leah Yui Tung. I believe I. Yes, yeah, uh, well, close. Uh, Can I you do hear me? Close. Yes. Okay. Go ahead, Leah. Good afternoon. My name is Leah Yui Tung. I'm speaking today as a resident and community advocate of Scarborough, whose family has been living in Ward 24 for almost 40 years. I'm also a member of the resident-run and resident-led grassroots group called the Woburn Local Planning Table that was made possible through initial funding from TSNS 2020. For that, I thank you. I would like to speak to you today specifically about the housing crisis that's currently affecting low to moderate income residents living in my neighborhood and its impact on their lives and those of their children. I'm one of the lucky ones. My father first arrived in Canada in 73 as a political refugee, and my mother and my six siblings and I were able to reunite with my father in 75, five years after he was wrongfully kidnapped and deported. For the first five years in Canada, we moved six times throughout Scarborough. My parents had to lie about how many children they had each time we applied for market rental housing, as no one would rent a two-bedroom apartment or even a four-bedroom townhome to a family of nine 
but that was all we could afford at that time. I'm proud and grateful to say that despite all the obstacles, they bought their first home within five years and moved to our current family home almost 40 years ago. I am privileged and grateful to say that all my family are doing well and remain safe during this time. I am privileged and grateful to our healthcare system to say that when my father fell ill with cancer, I was able to move in with them and help care for him at home so that he could die with dignity surrounded by family. I now live with my mother, who is able to stay in the home she loves, with my assistance and care and the company of myself and my teenage son. As I mentioned, I am one of the lucky ones. You may say that was then and that this is ancient history. However, the situation and scenario of my parents' struggles as immigrants is nothing new and it's not ancient history. It continues today. The big difference is that the cost of living and the rising cost of housing has made the dream of even living in a safe and affordable market rental unit, whether in a building or home, just that, a dream for many families. During the pandemic, I did a lot of outreach and community work in my neighborhood. Food and housing insecurity and its impact on families of low to moderate income, living in poorly managed, poorly maintained, and unaffordable market rental buildings has escalated to unprecedented proportions for the largely marginalized, racialized, and immigrant families. You've heard some of their deputations uh, and their stories today. Trapped in an apartment since March 2020 that many have called home since their arrival in Canada, many families I've gotten to know in my community are faced with black mold, barely working appliances, peeling paint, garbage strewn grounds, unfair repair fees, and the threat of eviction notices should they not pay those same fees. This isn't just a place they live in, but in the past year and possibly most of 2021, this has also been a place where they work and their children study 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I realized that there are many underlying factors that have brought the housing market to this situation. We hope you ensure that discussion for these solutions include resident grassroots voices and other voices in these past few days of deputations who spoke on housing. To build the community we envision for our neighborhood and for Scarborough, I want so many things. More than anything, though, I want the city committee to keep in mind the areas in Toronto hardest hit during this pandemic, Scarborough, North Etobicoke, and never to lose sight of this vision and work together to build this with all stakeholders. But for this year's city budget, I urge you to maintain rent control, rent and tenant supports that are currently in place and to increase access to these same supports and services so that low to middle income tenants living in market rent housing are eligible. Scarborough residents are falling through the cracks and they need your consideration now. We, and I include all of you on the committee, are the privileged and lucky ones. They need our help now. It's time for action and to work together to address the many inequities in our city. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no questions, we'll move on to Elizabeth Bala. Welcome, Elizabeth. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you, go ahead. Hi, hi, my name is Elizabeth Bala and I'm a resident of Ward 11. Um, I probably won't take the whole five minutes. I just wanted to make my first deputation today to echo all the calls to cut the police budget by 50%. In my opinion, as a student of abolition, 50% uh, is actually 50% not enough, but we need to start somewhere. And 50% um, is a good starting place, I would say. So far, the speakers today have demonstrated that there's no shortage of better uses for that astronomical budget. The cost of living um, and housing has been increasing in Toronto for the six years that I've lived here, which I acknowledge it's not a very long time. Um, but in that same time, I've noticed the budget of the police has been increasing. I work in the shelter system. So I've noticed that a lot of the time when there's calls to defund the police in Toronto, um, the Toronto police have often defended their budget by saying, well, we have so many calls, we can't even deal with them all. Um, I, would, I would say that a lot of the calls are very preventable if communities were properly invested in, um, if people had adequate resources. The other pieces that I hear, oh, well, we need more funding because you're right, the, the police could be better. We need to teach them about equity and de-escalation. And I can say I'm five feet tall. I work in the shelter system and you don't need the police to de-escalate. When you have someone with a uniform and a weapon walking into 
to an already escalated situation, this is only further escalating things. And I, again, I hear, oh, well, we need this budget for body cams. I'm not interested in seeing the death of Black racialized Indigenous people on high definition camera. Um, there's, we don't need equity training. We don't need de-escalation trainings. We need to take away the budget and reinvest in our communities that are drowning and that have been hit the hardest by COVID. Um, and yeah, that's that's really all I have to say is that there's no, we can't really try to improve community relations anymore. We're way past that. And I know I'm only speaking for myself, but I'm reflecting um, the values that a lot of people in my ward and other wards and that work with me um, share and the people that I work with, um, those that are homeless share, because I, I just have never seen an instance of the police actually protecting anyone or de-escalating anything. I've only seen violence. Um, and that doesn't mean that they're not great individuals <laughs> um, on the force, but that's not really the question here. This is about the budget and the budget is too high. Like 50% is way too, like not even enough of a cut. So that's, that's all I have to say. And thank you for your time. Thank you. Next we have Musa Alou. Musa Alu. Hi, um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak today. This is my first time doing a deputation. Um, I'm not a very good speaker, unfortunately, but uh, I think I need to say this and I've been wanting to bring this up uh, to the city councilors for over a decade now. Um, because of my experience living in uh, England for quite some time, I got hold of some of their housing policies, which really intrigued me. And I think which can be very beneficial to our city, um, some of those aspects. Um, I live in Scarborough and I'm a parent council representative in my child school. And I, I'm also an active social worker and I volunteer in my community in Scarborough War 24, and I've been in Canada last 20 years. Um, today, I want to speak of alternate ways of reducing the longer wait years for low income housing support applicants. Um, the city currently spends hundreds of millions of dollars every year behind subsidized and support housing for low to moderate income families and for at risk families and seniors which is very great. Um, this service is provided through the, um, through city's own properties, TCSC properties, and in partnerships with other cooperatives. Um, my solution to um, the long wait times that a lot of speakers have been mentioning here today, which have gone like 20 years back, it was two years, now it's gone to 18 years. 15, 18 years, uh, which is, um, I think, uh, not a good um, number to deal with. So one of the ways to reduce that wait time and significantly lower the cost of providing subsidized housing is to pay for the rent of the waitlist applicants at, at their existing private uh, rental units in considered zones. Like I understand that in downtown Toronto, it is very, expensive to pay the rent of private landlords, but other areas like Scarborough or Malvern or Etobicoke, which the city can afford to pay, I think they should pay those people's rents directly to the landlords. And um, I think that will take a great deal of, um, of the burden of the city and the people who have been waiting for all these years to get support for the housing. Um, it will also uh, save a lot of money for the city in terms of administrative costs, maintenance costs, paying the contractors to do all the maintenance work, while the same will be done by the landlords, by the private landlords. And I have known in some instances where the city has uh, used private landlords um, to house um, house um, um, 
housing, uh, subsidized housing tenants uh, due to some issues. And they have been moved in those buildings for temporary or even for a longer period. But taking this opportunity would, um, would be more beneficial and save a lot of taxpayers money. And um, uh, this, is, this is one way um, I think the city should look into, uh, which is also a, a long-term model uh, from England, where the, uh, the councils, as they are called, uh, they utilize uh, this method to uh, pay for people's um, rents where they can't afford to pay themselves partially or completely. Uh, the second way I have a suggestion is the city can introduce funding to build uh, pay to own housing for select families with a uh, small or large number of children where the families pay back the city every month in the form of installments and bear the cost of maintenance. And as the properties will be brand new, the maintenance will be low for at least 10 to 15 years. And uh, they can pay for the they can pay the city administrative fee every month as well, and pay the property taxes at a reduced rate. Currently, the city invests millions in capital to build housing, properties, subsidize rent, pays for administrative um, expenses around three hundred million dollars. You have to wrap in up maintenance please. cost. Yes. Uh, this option will help low-income families towards owning the properties in the long run while reducing the financial burden on the city. I hope and pray that the city considers these options and work on mitigating a solution based on these suggestions. I'm more than willing to elaborate more on these options given the opportunity to generate a research study. I thank all of you for being patient and considerate to listen to my opinion and hope that my suggestions bear fruit for everyone. Thank you. Councillor Layton has a question. Yes, sir. Yes, thank you very much, Musa. And my question first is, next time, will you come to us sooner than a decade and come and speak to us and bring your ideas more than a day, like sooner than a decade away? Because we, we can't have it that we've got good people <laughs> in the city bringing ideas from other parts of the world and bringing them forward. Now, um, I would say I just point you towards one thing uh, is Toronto's rent, Toronto has a rent supplement program. I'd be really curious because I don't know much about the UK model, but I'd be really curious to know how it differs uh, and how many rent supplements, uh, or because we call them rent supplements here, but how many that the UK provides compared to Toronto? Because in Tor Toronto, um, there's, there's not many, like we're talking a couple thousand rather That's than okay. what it sounds like what's happening in other areas. I, I think one of the main differences though, is there's no, there's no geographic relationship with our rent supplements program. It's an, it's geared to income. Uh, and, and then we do qualify units though, based on um, there's, I, I suppose, I, I don't know the details about how we qualify units, but probably about what standard they're, they're at. So I, I'd encourage you to take a look at that and then do a little comparison for us and like, please send something our way to see if there's a better way that they're doing it elsewhere that we might be able to adopt here. And thank yeah, you. Yeah, uh, as far as my knowledge is um, about the rent geared to income uh, uh, program, um, private landlords um, are not considered and um, uh, applicants are not allowed to, uh, um, they're not paid those rents um, with private landlords. And, um, about the decade old thing. I wanted to bring this up, but there was a discussion um, taken up um, a decade back in this regard. And the city, I don't know if you know about this, but the city had considered these options uh, to pay private landlords, but uh, due to some legal or uh, legalities of these aspects, it was a little complicated. They put it, put it up for study, but then it was ditched eventually. So the rent supplement program is with with private landlords. Um, the the one that the city currently has, but it's really small. Yeah, that's where it needs to be expanded and looked into, um, because I believe the administrative costs, the maintenance of keeping up our own properties, is very high, and that will significantly take away all that big cost 
and it's hundreds of millions of dollars every year. And um, as I, as I, my other option was for city to finance properties where, you know, uh, habitat for humanity, there's, if the city can um, adopt their model for families with big number of children who are very small, and they can somehow, I've spoken to dozens of families and they can, they are more than willing to take up these kinds of properties and pay every month, say even $2,000 every month compared to mortgaging if they are saving on interest, which is, which takes a big chunk of their payment. And that is a big reason why these big families with a lot of children, they cannot afford to take mortgages. So, and at, in the longer, maybe 10 years, because the cost the city will incur uh, if they allot crown land and the construction cost, which is around $300,000 uh, per unit, per home, per small to moderate home is around 300,000. And with the uh, fact that if the city can provide crown land to build these properties on within 10 years at $2,000 a month, uh, two to $3,000 this uh, the uh, people can the families can own the property and the city will get its money back will get its investment back rather than losing it thank you thank you sir next is uh, clement chong clement chong hello can you hear me yes we hello. can go Hi. ahead okay excellent great thank you so much uh, good afternoon, counselors. Uh, my name is Clement, and I'm 23 years old. I was born in Counselor Carroll's Ward, Don Valley North, and I now live in Counselor Layton's Ward of University of Rosedale. Um, I've never spoken at a city committee before, but I really feel that I have no choice but to speak up today in asking you to defund and reallocate the Toronto police budget. This summer, in the middle of the historic and enormous uprisings against state violence, uh, I participated in this really beautiful and illuminating community conversation. Our facilitator was a writer named Delfina Yawan, and she posed this question that we don't really think about enough. Delfina asked us, what does safety mean to you? Like, when you think about safety, what does it sound like to you? What does it look like to you? What does it feel like to you? And I wanted to share with you just some of the responses that folks gave. People said that, and I'm quoting verbatim here, safety, it's freedom from harm. Safety is liberation from fear. Safety feels grounded in trust and calm. Safety is chosen family. Safety means affirmation and vulnerability. Safety is home. Safety, it's feeling loved. Safety is feeling warmth. Safety means dependability. Safety means not having to be afraid. Safety means abundance. Safety is being alive to live freely. Safety is making mistakes. Safety is care and tenderness. Safety is accountability. It's mercy and it's grace. Safety is the comfort and the space to confidently plan for the future. Safety is being allowed to exist as you are. Now, is there something you're noticing here? Because I am. What Delfina pointed out in her many years of leading these workshops on community safety, it's that rarely, if ever, do people mention cops or law enforcement. When people talk about feeling safe, they always talk about having the trust. They always talk about the care that they receive in exchange from their neighbors. They talk about freedom. Nobody ever says, Safety means having more cops in my neighborhood. And so I want to turn to the question of who exactly in our communities is capable of establishing that trust, of establishing that care, that safety, who is and already has done that work. Because there's one thing I know, and that it really is not the cops. Uh, I'm a young queer Torontonian just having finished school. And in my lifetime, I have come of age as a serial killer, tore through the village. I have grown up 
knowing that the murders of trans women of color like Allura Wells and Samaya Dalmar have still gone unsolved to this day. I have had to witness cops and trap sex workers on the job and ensnare gay men in our public parks. The Toronto police have proven themselves completely incapable of building trust, incapable of providing safety. And so, as we build alternatives, I am asking you councillors to do what is right and defund the police by 50%. Redirect this funding to the people in our communities who know what real safety looks and feels like. We can all see for ourselves that the city's new community crisis pilot is being set up to fail. For instance, how the hell is a TPS mounted unit getting more funding than this non-lethal community mental health response? The cop horses have an annual budget of five and a half million dollars, whereas this pilot program is somehow expected to stretch out $1.7 million over the course of three years? Is this seriously where your priorities are as our elected representatives? Where show ponies, the cops show ponies, are literally worth more dollars and cents than our lives? Because if that is the case, if you vote in this budget to keep over-policing us, I can guarantee that we will be organizing like hell to throw you out of office come 2022. So please, counselors, do right by us. Defund the police and give our communities a shot at real safety. Thank you for your time. Thank you. The next three um, speakers are Mahan Jakumar, Prajapati, Maria Miller, and Brianna or Brianne White. Mahan Jakumar. Mahan Jakumar. Are you there? One more time for Mahan Jakumar. Okay, we'll come back if uh, if the, if he's still there. Oh, hello. Okay, next is Maria Miller. Hello. Hi, Maria. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Great. You have five minutes. Okay. Go ahead. Great. Thank you. Well, my name is Maria Miller, and I'm a violinist and composer who lives in Ward Nine. Um, I really appreciate Councillor Bailao and her staff for being so responsive, and their proactivity is what inspired me to speak to you today. So thank you for taking the time to listen. Toronto is facing a major budget crisis due to COVID-19, so I wanted to put forth a solution that makes money rather than spends it. So here's my proposal. Create a campaign called Balance the Budget Deficit Through Achieving Vision Zero. It would be a year-long blitz to mark the final year of Toronto's five-year Vision Zero plan that targets reckless drivers. This campaign will raise funds. Oh, can you hear me? Go ahead. Okay. This campaign would raise funds while truly increasing awareness. Most of all, it will get us much closer to achieving Vision Zero than in previous years. So my premise is that unlike many of the world's great cities, Toronto is a car mecca. And unfortunately, Toronto's drivers do not change their behavior for the benefit of others. They do, however, notice when they are affected. If you just do a Google search of Vision Zero Toronto, you'll see that the top query is Vision Zero camera location. In all of my world travels, and I lived in Manhattan for two decades, I have never encountered the reckless driving I see in Toronto daily, and especially in my neighborhood of Silverthorne. It's what makes me want to leave this city, and the swearing, middle fingers, and death threats I've received just for gesturing to a vehicle to keep their distance when I'm walking or biking, it leaves me speechless. My car insurance more than doubled when I moved from Ottawa to Toronto. The insurer told me it's because of how bad the drivers are. Toronto has a unique problem because Ontario does not mandate yearly inspections. So things like fully tinted windows and modified exhaust systems run rampant and create reckless driving. In New York State, annual inspections would revoke the right to drive. Yes? So I keep hearing a hello. <laughs> so 
There are cities that have it. Oh, yeah. Continue. Pardon me. No, continue. Everything's fine. Oh, okay. There are cities that have achieved Vision Zero for pedestrians, like Oslo and Helsinki, and countries with long and consistent records, like Sweden and the Netherlands. Paris is constantly in the news for its 15-minute city campaign to make all amenities in all neighborhoods accessible by foot or bike within 15 minutes. So let's use our campaign as a way to train drivers for once and for all that no matter where you drive in Toronto, whether it's industrial or in the heart of the city, there are pedestrians and cyclists at every turn. Driving is a privilege. Walking and cycling should be a right. As long as the priorities are reversed, death and injury will prevail. So here's the plan. I think we should kick off the campaign by involving the public. Do a citywide questionnaire on what traffic infractions people would most like to see addressed. Then we choose the top six to 12 issues and target them for one full year. Alternatively, you could dedicate one to two months for each if you want to highlight them individually. So set goals for how much money will be earned through fining people for breaking driving laws and then we can even give the public advance notice if it generates lots of discussion around these perennial problems. I kind of think the controversy of this would be so great just for creating instant awareness. The message would be simple. Beware. Wherever you're driving, no matter the time of day or night, you could be pulled over or photographed or fined for the following violations. So speeding and racing, texting and talking on cell phones while driving, running red lights, driving closer than one meter to bikers, passing on a right lane or a bike lane or even a left turn lane to beat traffic, driving large vehicles like cargo vans, trucks, and SUVs recklessly, tinted windows, excessive noise pollution, sitting, parking, or pulling over in bike lanes, aggression towards pedestrians and cyclists, drunk driving, and I guess you could even include idling because even though it's not dangerous, it's really bad for the health of pedestrians and cyclists. Um, I wanted to add that it makes no sense to me that parking violations get frequently ticketed compared to driving violations because the former doesn't injure anyone and the latter endangers pedestrians, bikers, and drivers alike. This fundraising blitz would be the quickest and most effective way to raise awareness in drivers. It would be great if we could streamline the ability for the public to report offenses. Um, I commend active TO, but in my neighborhood, drivers just move the pylons aside. Drivers will only things. change through their pocketbook, and Toronto needs that money more than ever. Um, I also applaud the use of mobile speed cameras, because even if it's just for one box block, I see cars slow down a little bit. Just have so to wrap to up, conclude, I want to share what I recently read. An unimpeded vehicle is a weapon. We should work to redesign the roads and sidewalks to prevent a vehicle from being able to be a weapon. But in the meantime, training drivers through penalties for breaking the law will add to the budget while making the city safer, healthier, and more world class. Thank you so much you. for your time. Thank you very much, Maria. Next, uh, Brianne White. Am I coming through okay? I can hear you great. Yes, go ahead. Excellent. Uh, good afternoon, council members. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Brianne White. I'm a resident of Ward 12 and a teacher and a mother to a young child. I also lead a group of concerned Toronto parents, grandparents and caregivers working to drive urgent climate action called For Our Kids. I am speaking here today to urge you to truly build back better by fully funding climate action in the 2021 city budget. I was compelled to depute today because of my son. At 15 months old, he is just beginning his life at a time when the window to preserve a livable world for him, his generation, and all who come after him is closing. Unfortunately, that's not hyperbole, it's science. If you are a parent, I have no doubt that you have thought about the consequences our children will have to endure if we fail to act immediately and boldly on climate. Although this council faces a challenge in delivering a budget during a global pandemic, I urge you not to let one crisis overshadow another. The climate crisis is still an emergency, one that requires immediate and unprecedented effort to overcome. And I ask you not to delay or deprioritize action we must take to give our children the best chance at a livable future. $2.5 million was cut from the 2021 Environment and Energy Budget. 
This will result in the delay of key commitments made in the climate emergency declaration of 2019. I ask you to consider the disconnect between declaring an emergency and then failing to act with urgency. The 2018 Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report warned that in order to have a livable world for our kids, we must hold warming to 1.5 degrees. To do that, we must do most of the heavy lifting on emissions reduction in the first half of this decade. While Toronto is currently on track to meet its 2030 target, we cannot rest on our laurels now. In fact, Toronto has been warned by the Atmospheric Fund to double down on its emissions reduction work as the hardest part of the plan, retrofitting buildings and electrifying transportation is still ahead. We cannot afford any delays. If we are serious about addressing the climate emergency, the $2.5 million cut to the environment and energy budget must be restored. Secondly, prioritizing spending on the Gardner Expressway at a time of conflating health and climate crises seems misaligned with building back better. In order to truly prioritize health, equity, and climate, shift money away from the Gardner and into active transportation infrastructure and transit that will enhance the health of Toronto residents and build climate resilience. I echo the many calls of the uh, deputation before me to reallocate 50% of funds from the police budget to affordable housing and community supports. These measures will go further to ensure the health and well-being of Toronto residents, particularly our most vulnerable members. And finally, I ask that you not delay any of the commitments outlined in the Climate Emergency Declaration of 2019. Establish a dedicated climate fund, divest from fossil fuel investments, and apply a robust climate lens to all spending decisions so that we can truly build back better. We need to protect our kids from an even bigger crisis looming in their future by financing climate action now. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank you very much. Next is uh, Diana Gibbs, and then after that will be Reverend Maggie Helwig, and then Reverend Andrea uh, Budgie. Diana Gibbs, you're up. Can you hear me? We can, go ahead. Thank you. Um, so good afternoon, everyone, and I wanna thank you for your time for, and for the opportunity to contribute today. Um, my name is Diana Gibbs. I'm a resident of Ward 19, Beaches East York, represented by Brad Bradford. I've lived in the same house for 25 years near Woodbine and Danforth and raised two children who are now in their mid twenties. Um, and this is the first time I have made a deputation to the council. Um, I feel strongly about the need to speak uh, about taking action on addressing the climate crisis and the previous deputant I thought put it very, very well. So I may not uh, go into as much detail as I had planned to because I think she made the case well. Um, but in the clock is ticking, and while the federal and government and provincial governments have a major role to address these issues, I'm also looking to Toronto to shoulder its responsibility. I am really aware of the dire situation we are in with the city facing a huge budget shortfall of, of $1.5 billion from the costs and the lost revenues of the pandemic. And also that COVID has had much more severe impact on lower income and racialized residents, especially in our outer neighborhoods. So I do applaud uh, you for setting equity, health and well-being and climate action as your stated priorities in the budget. But my concerns are that some investments do not align with them. And the, although I agree with many of the earlier speakers around defunding the calls to defund police and invest in community services, my focus really relates on how the city is moving forward to address climate emergency goals that the council declared in October 2019. At that time, you directed the Office of Environment and Energy to deliver a strategy to achieve net zero emissions, a strategy to create low carbon jobs, as well as a climate and equity lens for major decisions. However, we've just heard your proposed cut of 2.5 million or 17% of this office's budget is going to create a challenge to provide um, this, the necessary staff required to deliver on these commitments. I'm also concerned as well that 40% of the 10 year transportation capital budget is allocated towards rebuilding the Gardner. If this, this not only prioritizes car commuters, but it's taking funding away from repairing and expanding our public transportation system. If equity in public health and well being are truly a priority, investments must be directed to affordable, reliable public transit, especially that serves the outer neighborhoods 
as well as it to improving cycling routes and pedestrian safety. I do want to say I was delighted with the quick installation of the Bloor Danforth bike lanes in the past year, and I'm hoping that can be extended to Young Street. But given the 1.5 billion gap on your budget and the unprecedented demand, as we've heard earlier, for affordable housing, childcare, and emergency services, I would uh, want to urge you. Oh no, I think my computer's dying. Just give me one second. Ah! Just give me one sec to plug in. That was unanticipated. Sorry. So just give me one second here. There we go. Um, you can tell it's my first time. Anyways, uh, let me go back to what I was going to say. I was about to urge you to look on the revenue side. And I really do support. I know you're making every effort possible to advocate at the federal and provincial level for funding, but there are revenue tools the city does have access to. Uh, I'm referring particularly to those outlined in the budget brief by the Social Planning Council. And I do bear in mind the equity impacts of these, but I would personally support increasing the property tax beyond the current proposed rate of 0.7% and directing this revenue to frontline needs. I am a homeowner, but I've also worked in the nonprofit sector uh, for many, many years, and I do feel there is quite enough wealth in our city to be able to sustain an increase. I would uh, also be supportive of restoring the vehicle registration tax and increasing the municipal land transfer tax for real estate selling for over $2 million. And again, having that funding support nonprofit, affordable and supportive housing. So just to sum up my message to the council is please don't reduce the budget for environment and energy division office and ensure that office does have adequate resources to achieve your commitments to address the climate emergency. Reallocate funding away from the constant repair of the gardener invested in public transportation, cycling and safer streets and use the revenue tools available to Toronto while continuing to advocate strongly with the federal and provincial government to close the funding gap. Finally, I would just call on you to continue to apply a robust climate health and equity lens to all major spending decisions to ensure that our spending advances, not hinders the creation of a more prosperous, inclusive and greener city. Thank you. Seeing no questions, thank you very much for your deputation today. Next is uh, Reverend Maggie Helwig. Reverend? Okay. Hello. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. I think I'm probably familiar to a number of people here, but I am the chair of the Social Justice and Advocacy Committee for the Anglican Diocese of Toronto. Um, I come to you aware that this is a budget drawn up under exceptional circumstances um, and that the city has over the last year had to respond to a very unusual crisis and has responded in ways which have um, often been creative and compassionate. Um, nevertheless, there are, there are holes in this budget as presented that need to be addressed um, a number have already been addressed. Um, there is a need for much more significant support for a number of community initiatives, which will reduce the inequities which have been revealed by the pandemic. There is absolutely a need to continue to fund the climate initiatives outlined in the climate emergency declaration. And uh, I'd like to address, well, put my strong support behind people who have spoken to that. I want to speak specifically about the emergency shelter and housing aspect, which I think hasn't been addressed by too many people. The current budget foresees only a very small increase to shelter services and housing, really aimed at continuing the current level of emergency shelter provision I think that it is very clearly evident that the current level of emergency shelter provision is insufficient. This budget raises a lot of concerns around the system's capacity, staffing, the range of emergency shelter options that are being offered, and the ability to provide adequate COVID safety and outbreak management. Um, I don't believe that shelter services will be able to address these issues with what they are being given in the current budget. Um, 
we know there are many people who are still sleeping outside. And although there's been a lot of attention paid to encampments, and quite rightly, there are many other people sleeping rough who are not in encampments. And I believe that population is still being undercounted. Um, so we need to take that into account as well. Um, on housing, clearly, we all wish that other levels of government, and especially the province, were coming to the table more effectively. <laughs> um, but failing that, um, first, I will applaud what the city has done in, mod in the modular housing projects, which are now going up. This has been great. It's been creative. It's been fast. Um, I'm really happy to see this. We, we need to see more of this. And again, we need to see more money going into shelter services and housing in order to provide more deeply affordable and supportive housing, because we know that emergency shelter is only an immediate stopgap. It's not what anyone wants. People want to be in housing. We want people to be in housing. The construction of the housing has to happen. Um, and as I say, we all wish the other levels of government would come to the table more effectively, and we are happy to help lobby them to try to make that happen. Obviously, uh, if we're asking for increases in spending, we need to be looking at sources of revenue. A number have already been identified by other speakers. Um, less money going into the Gardner project. Um, support for a more significant property tax increase. Our property tax continues to be extremely low compared to neighboring jurisdictions. And I believe that the current increase probably could be pushed further. Uh, a substantial reduction in the police budget, as many people have mentioned, um, and more investment into community alternatives for policing, which can be more cost efficient, I think, Using the police as a kind of societal multi-tool is not working out very well. They're, they are being asked to do many things which should not be policing functions. And we need to cut back on that and cut the police budget significantly. A vacant homes tax, a land transfer tax, I believe both of these have been mentioned. Um, Two other things I would highlight are a commercial parking levy, which I'm not sure has been mentioned yet, and the restoration of the vehicle registration tax, both of which are both revenue sources and um, incentives towards climate action, but good climate behavior. And I'm done now. So Perfect. seven seconds over. <laughs> that, that's okay. Thank you very much, Reverend. Questions from Councillor Carroll. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Reverend Maggie, for for coming back. You're you're here annually. Yes, so I am. That's why I wanted to ask this question: um, parking taxes. You can imagine. I don't know if you know how it works, but uh, the people who would be right away uh, singing out against that in this year of all years would be the 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 large owners of shopping centers. They would call mm -hmm. it the final nail in the coffin of retail, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, in terms of new revenue tools, as much as you know how long I've advocated for them, but but there there's going to be little willingness to make any big moves. It's uh, the, the 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 way it seems um, in terms of increasing revenue. But as you have to come here every year because we are continually shortchanging ourselves and and trying to do more with less and ending up just doing less, um, should we at the very least start the conversation about that parking tax and other things should we look at the reverend coming back next budget uh uh season and the one after that unless we do make the big move so at the very least begin the community conversation so perhaps the change is possible next budget year in uh, revenue ab absolutely i mean i think it is you know you as municipal politicians and those of us who are faith leaders, we are all responsible for changing the conversation on taxes. For Even in really, terms of really increasingly yeah. presenting ta taxes as a public good, a good thing that we should be happy for because it's increasing our ability to live in a functional and equitable society. Right, right. Even in terms of 
changing the the relationship between the community and the police, which has been so much a feature of the mm -hmm. the the budget uh, um, uh, speakers this year. Um, the seed money to make that change has not been possible. And so we've got a very small amount of money trying to do a pilot. And until we do the pilot, we can't, we're not really making a good enough case to the police to scoop all the dollars out of their budget. Even to do those types of big moves, it would mean so much in the community. We need to change that revenue picture so that we would have the change agent uh, dollars to work with. Isn't that, would yep. that make sense to you? Absolutely, that makes that makes perfect sense. Um, and obviously, we you know we'd all like it to happen instantly, but we keep working. <laughs> right. Okay. Thank you. Thanks so much for coming again. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is Reverend Andrea Budgie. Reverend, welcome. Thank you. Um, I'm, I appreciate the opportunity to speak. I am here primarily as a backup for my colleague Maggie Helwig. Um, in case she was called out to an emergency. So really, I, I will content myself today with echoing what she has said with observing that um, what city staff have done during the pandemic has been remarkable and is, is not unnoticed or unappreciated. Um, I, I would also like to observe that we, we cannot police ourselves into equity or police people into housing, that we need to refocus our attention on community supports and um, and save the police from work that they, as Chief Saunders observed more than once, really aren't equipped to be doing. Um, that's all I will say about that. Um, Changing the conversation about taxes is hugely important, and I would simply ask on that that um, you recognize that faith leaders are able to help shape that conversation, and that that many of us stand ready to do it, and uh, and are willing to work with the city on that. Um, as I'm just a backup, I will leave it at that and uh, allow you to uh, to move on to the next speaker. Thank you so much. Thank you, Reverend. Uh, you were definitely a good backup and a good echo. Uh, the next three speakers are Christina Wang, Lucy Drummond, and Yakova Knappen. Christina Wang, welcome. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I would like to begin by thanking the Budget Committee for taking the time to discuss the community's concerns for the 2021 budget. My name is Christina Wang, and today I'm speaking on behalf of Toronto 350 a local climate justice group whose members support Transform TO and an equitable green recovery. We are extremely disappointed in this year's inadequately supported climate action budget and have serious concerns about the $2.5 million cut to the Environment and Energy Division. As others have mentioned, this decrease in funding does not match the urgency of action required to have the City of Toronto meet its goal of 2050 net zero carbon emission. So far, global temperatures have risen just over one degree and have already caused extreme climate events such as drought, flooding, fires, and ice storms. Toronto cannot ignore these distressing events and believe itself insulated from the calamities of climate change. Presently, wildfire officials on, in Ontario are already advising the province to expect forest fires to increase in frequency and intensity. These warnings were the same ones given by the Oregon wildfire officials prior to the violent 2020 fires, wildfires in Oregon. Toronto must be aware and extremely alarmed, not only by the deadly effects of such events, but by the financial costs that such severe climate events pose. Many will have fresh in their memory the frequent flooding that has occurred the past several years in Toronto. In 2020 alone, such floods cost $80 million to Toronto residents and insurers. By 2030, it is projected that the flooding costs will nearly triple from the 2010 number in Canada to $6.6 .6 billion and will particularly affect cities like Toronto and their urban infrastructure. With the current projections of temperature rise to be four to five degrees by 2100, the impacts of severe and frequent weather events would not only create increasingly devastating economic loss, but will make the world nearly uninhabitable. The city has witnessed firsthand how disasters such as the COVID-19 pandemic can cause lasting economic harm and enormous budget deficits, such as the present estimated $1.6 billion, budget, billion dollar budget shortfall for 2021. We must therefore act now to keep 
global temperature rise to a maximum of two degrees to prevent the existential threat and devastating economic costs of climate change. In order to accomplish these twin goals, it is imperative that Toronto immediately and fully commit to its aim of net zero carbon emission by 2050. The UN, the UN has projected that there's only a decade left to prevent the irreversible damage from climate change. This next decade is therefore critical. There's no more time to make excuses and further delay necessary climate initiatives and investments for another year. Toronto must immediately begin to massively accelerate divestment from fossil fuel use and investment in climate policies. We advise the city to take these five actionable steps. First, do not cut the Environment and Energy Division budget. The $2.5 million is absolutely essential. Second, immediately cancel rebuilding the Gardner Expressway and shift the savings from the cancellation to transfer TO. The Gardner Expressway budget for the next decade is currently $2.2 billion, which is in stark contrast to the $356 million allocated to the climate emergency budget for the next decade. A next shift at least 10% of the law enforcement budget of $1 billion to housing, health, and crime prevention programs with sustainable infrastructure that advance the equity, health, and resilience of vulnerable com communities. Fourth, reintroduction of the vehicle registration tax at a standard rate of $60 per uh, individual per year. This will produce an additional $55 million in revenue that could be used to fund Transform TO's transportation goals, the city's bike lane program, and the express bus plan. This strategy would also be more equitable for the community. For the last decade, Toronto has been given preferential treatment to vehicle owners over low income users of public transportation by increasing TTC fares to fund the, low, the transportation sector, sector. Such a strategy clearly negatively impacts and disproportionately places the burden of revenue for the transit sector on low income riders. Lastly, increase the property tax in Toronto from 0.7 percent to 1.7 percent. This would generate $30 million in additional revenue available for investment. It is important to emphasize here that Toronto's current property taxes are amongst the lowest of the Greater Toronto Hamilton area, and therefore an increase is not only overdue, but highly appropriate. We urge the committee to put climate lens on all their budgetary decisions and to carefully consider the long-term and irreversible effects of their decisions. Toronto needs to take immediate, bold, and drastic action because this next decade is critical in keeping the world a habitable place for both current and future generations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Seeing no questions, we'll go next to Lucy Drummond. Lucy, you there? Lucy Drummond? One more time for Lucy, if you're having some challenges, just uh, maybe contact clerk. So they'll try to reach out to you to see if we uh, have connection problems. Next, uh, Yakoba can happen. Welcome, Yakoba. Hello, good afternoon. Good and afternoon. Hello, thank you, Budget Chief Crawford and City Councillors for the opportunity for this deputation. I live in Ward 11, Councillor Mike Layton's ward. And I work in the 401 Richmond building in Ward 10, Councillor Joe Cressy's ward for the Toronto Alliance for the Performing Arts, TAPA, where I'm the executive director, serving 164 professional theatre and dance and opera companies here in the city. Our membership is all encompassing um, and it ranges from commercial to not for profit theatre companies. Uh, I'm not sure if Jennifer, uh, Councillor McKelvey is aware of the scope of the national institutions and the emerging independent companies that we serve. Uh, our work, of course, is recognized every year, as many of you know, at the annual Dora Maven Moore Awards, which are Canada's largest and oldest professional theatre, dance and opera award show. Last year, we presented the Dora Maven Moore Awards Virtual Edition 2020. Uh, so the COVID-19 pandemic has resulted in, I'm going to say it, unprecedented but necessary closure of Toronto. 69 theatres, uh, again, for Councillors Bradford and McKelvey, if you were not aware, we have 69 uh, performing arts venues here in the City of Toronto. Uh, the TAPA member companies have cancelled all of their shows, all of their productions, and we have conducted three COVID-19 impact surveys with our membership. The financial impact to date 
which is now out of date, we need to do another one, is 25,000 cancelled or postponed public performances, $500 million in lost ticket sales, and 20 million lost audience members. 82% of our TAPA members anticipate a decrease in philanthropic giving to their organizations. And the COVID pandemic took a particularly heavy toll on the arts sector. One in four arts workers lost their job in 2020. This is the largest loss in employment in any sector in Canada. And that was just released through the Capicola report last week. More numbers. TAPA recently engaged in the National Arts and Culture Impact Survey, NASIS, that was just released. And I have two top takeaways to share with all of you. In spite of the challenges, our sector is resilient, and we know this. We've pivoted between August and October 2020. 72% of the organizations have produced some type of programming, uh, with 67 creating digital content, 67%. However, the second top takeaway is that it's very difficult to monetize digital content and 43% do not feel financially prepared for the second wave of COVID-19 that we're now experiencing. We are continuing to look at ways that we can grow, that we can strengthen the success of the cultural sector for our industry to recover when it is ready to come back. And on behalf of the board of directors and all of the TAPA members, I want to thank you all on the budget committee. I want to thank you so much for maintaining your commitment to arts and culture and for sustaining the funding to the Toronto Arts Council. Looking ahead, the one year grim anniversary is coming up. It's almost there. And we're looking to a future when our sector reopens that we need to be prepared. We're doing this work on many levels. Uh, we were a founding partner in the Lights On Reopening Guide uh, created in preparation for when we are able to reopen our theatres. We worked in partnership with Ryerson School of Creative Industries, the Toronto Arts Council and the Toronto Arts Foundation, TO Live and SOCAN. And I want to give a shout out to the City of Toronto for your support on the Lights On Reopening Guide. As a community, our number one priority is the safety of our artists and our employees, but also the front of house and of our patrons. So we've been working in partnership with the Ontario Arts Council and the Wolf Brown Audience Monitor Study. Uh, there's plenty of fantastic data, but what I want to share with you is our limit in our limited time is all of the data tells us that we need to regain the confidence of even the most ardent arts fans to return to live event spaces. So part of that is going to be achieved in the PPE project that we're undertaking with TO Live to investigate bulk buying opportunities ensuring that PPE distribution is gonna be equitable and accessible for all the companies, regardless of their limited financial or human resources, so that the public experience is consistent and reliable, no matter what venue that they're going to. Um, we also did launch I Miss Live Theatre TO, and the citizens of Toronto miss live theatre. We know that we had over 5 million hits. So thank you for your investment. Thank you. We look forward to working with you. We're going to need your partnership more than ever in communicating to the province and to the feds. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jacob, and everything that you do for your sector. Thank you. Next is Daniel Colusi, and then Guillermo Penalosa, and then we'll be going back to uh, one of the other speakers who we just finally connected with. So, Daniel Colusi. Hello. Go ahead, Daniel. Hello. Hi. Hello, everyone. Thank you for letting me participate in this process. Uh, my name is Daniel Colusi. I'm a librarian, musician, and writer in the city. And I appreciate having your audience for just a few minutes so that I can speak to you about something that I feel passionately about, which is policing in Toronto and to specifically ask the Budget Committee to defund the Toronto Police Service's budget by 50% and reallocate those funds towards other city services, resources, programs, and infrastructure, such as affordable long-term housing, mental health support, drug addiction services, food security, transportation services, and of course, libraries, which are my own place of work. 
Very briefly, I want to tell you about a specific incident I stumbled into, which happened last June 2020. My girlfriend and I were walking through our neighborhood in Ward 9, Davenport, when we randomly came upon a scene at the edge of the public rail path. It was a mother and her two sons, aged roughly two to five. They were sitting on a bench being interrogated by two police officers. It was obvious that something wasn't right with this family. One of the boys was wearing shoes several sizes too big. The other boy was naked, wrapped in a blanket, and the mother looked completely exhausted and frightened. She kept her two sons close to her. She avoided eye contact with those officers and basically refused to speak or communicate with them. She would not provide the officers her name or her address despite their repeated requests. So my girlfriend and I stood by simply to remain peripherally visible to both the police officers and to this woman. And by remaining at the scene for an hour or so, certain things came to light. That this woman's English was very limited, that the police had been called by a nearby townhouse resident after one of the boys had told this resident that he was hungry and had no food. That this woman, in fact, lived just blocks away, but had left her home some time during the previous night in order to get away from her husband. One of the officers outlined the woman's options to us thusly. Either she could confirm to them her name and her address so that they could return her to that address, or refusing that, they would have to take her to child and family services, and there was a strong likelihood of her being separated from her children. Communicating with my girlfriend rather than the police officers, this woman revealed that she had a sister-in-law in Scarborough and that her preference was to go to her. We made contact with that sister-in-law, and after some time, my girlfriend and I convinced the officers that we would take responsibility for escorting this woman and her kids to Scarborough. I'm not offering this story to the Budget Committee as a trite and naive suggestion that by defunding the police, we will in turn make all the difficult and complex social issues to which they respond simply disappear. We know that they won't. But rather, I'm suggesting that this is a material example, a case study, of our current policing apparatus, a malformed apparatus, an apparatus in which the police are inappropriately drawn into situations that they are untrained and inequipped to deal with, situations in which the police can often cause more harm than good. So what I wanna make clear is that this call to defund the police is also a call to detask the TPS so that they're not inappropriately drawn into situations that they're not trained, equipped, or prepared to work through situations in which their very presence increases harm. The call to defund the police is in turn a call to reallocate the funds from the massive police budget and apply those dollars towards other kinds of community services, resources, and programming that are initiated, developed, and deployed by the very communities that they serve. And finally, the call to defund the police is a demand that the city's elected officials take seriously the very real problem of policing in the city and respond to this problem of policing in a way that is critical, progressive, visionary, and take the form of real, material, quantifiable change in the city's 2021 budget. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for your, uh, your words. Uh, next is uh, Gil Penalosa. Gil, are you there? Hello? Hello, how are you? Can you hear me? We can hear you well, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, I think that I was expecting in 2021 a radically different budget. Uh, if, the, if there is a time for to be bold, to be ambitious, to do things different, it's in 2021. Under COVID, I don't think has changed much. COVID has given us kind of like magnifying glasses to see some issues that were there in front of us, such as lack of equity, such as lack of sidewalks. One out of four streets in Toronto don't have a sidewalk. And now we need to walk physically distance and, this, and, and sometimes we prefer to have parked cars rather than widen the sidewalks. The issues of poverty, the issues of housing. I was expecting a budget that would put a lot more money into public health but not only related to COVID. I think that COVID has shown us that public health has been involved in everything that the city does. We need public health in the committee of parks. We need the public health in, 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 in transportation. We need public health almost on everything we do. Also, I was expecting, there are some things that is very little money. 
For example, golf courses. It doesn't make any sense that in 2021, a city has golf public golf courses where at most 220 people can play in one day instead of turning those golf courses into parks. Also, we have a huge deficit of housing. So imagine those golf courses, half of it for public park and half of it, half of it for housing. These are the kind of things that are gonna make Toronto a more equitable and more sustainable city. It's unthinkable of having public golf courses. I mean, if a city has lots of parks and no housing issue, okay, have golf courses. If not, let's have the golf courses way out in the suburbs, not in Toronto. Also, it doesn't cost a lot of money to have citywide maximum 30 kilometers an hour. We are killing people. A person walking is being hit by a person driving a car every four hours in Toronto. A person on a bicycle every seven hours. That is not civilized. Uh, now, Toronto police started a one week uh, educating process. It's not a one week. We need these 52 weeks of the year. This doesn't make sense. We have a climate action plan approved by unanimous. Why was it approved unanimous? Because there was zero budget attached to it. This is the moment to put a lot of money into it. For example, when the people talk about defunding the police, I think we should defund it at least 10%. Uh, also, we should reassign some of the issues that the police does. Uh, for example, we should forget about the rail deck park. I think we should purchase the air rights and then maybe even negotiate with a developer. So instead of putting $2 billion eventually to do a park of 20 acres, let's do a 10 acre park and a 10 acre developer development that will pay for that park. But we need other things, university park. Let's do university park that would transform Toronto. It's easily doable. All of it is public land. Uh, we're going to continue almost with the same car lanes, except that we're going to take half of it and are going to make it a park. It would be on, it could be done in the next four years. If some of you are reelected within this term or in the, by the middle of the next term, it would be done. It's only $200 million. It's totally doable. Ravines, ravines are 17% of our city. We need ravine strategy. We need to fund it. We imagine if we put instead of $2 billion into the rail deck park or into anything, let, let's put 500 million into ravines. The ravines are 17% of the area of the city. It goes through high income, low income everywhere. And, it's, and it would be actually the highlight of Toronto. Let's do the network of protected bikeways. I mean, Blur is nice, but we, th th let's not congratulate ourselves so much about Blur. Blur was approved in the year 2000, then in 2010, then in 2016. And we were going to do it in 2020 anyway. We had the budget and it was approved. But if you, if now 30% of your ride is safe because of Blur, but 70% is not, it's not going to work. So don't even think of evaluating Blur without doing a minimum network. We need a, at least four going east west and at least eight going north south. And finally, money. There is tons and tons of money. The gardener, go and ask citizens of Toronto if they are willing to pay $2,000 per household. Ask people if they want to pay $2,000 per household, 666 per person, man, woman, or child so that 2% of the commuters will save three minutes a day. So money is not the issue. I have to wrap up, please. Well, wrapping up is also that we need to increase the taxes. We cannot have the lowest tax in the GTHA when we have huge problems of poverty. One out of four children live in poverty. We got over 100,000 people on the wait list for housing. So there's absolutely uh, no excuse to not have the guts to do what is right, to increase the property tax. Thanks, Gil. Appreciate that. Uh, we're going to go back. The last uh, speaker is uh, one earlier that finally got connected, um, Mahendra Kumar Prajabati. Hello. Hello, how are you? Hi, uh, I'm good. Uh, good. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Five uh, minutes. I, thanks for... Uh, giving me opportunity to speak to the budget deputation committee. Uh, I would like to address some challenge problems presently we are facing. Nowadays, many landlords 
are not complying with the tenants' benefit officially announced by the government. They are not complying to implement the property tax deduction benefit declared by the government. Also, many tenants are being subjected to big rent increase. In some cases, tenants are paying 70 to 80 percent more rent in compared to the rent they are they had paid in 2017. Many tenants are facing threatening behaviors from the landlords and when they call for repairs or maintenance, many times they have received N5 evacuation notice without any justifying reason. Many tenants do not have decent quality housing. Oftentimes, their homes need repairs their homes have big bugs and insects, and landlords are not complying with the Tenant Protection Act. They are not ensuring tenants' units are to have a good standards. Many tenants who have lived in these buildings for five to 10 years are able to get, not able to get their unit repaired, even though year by year, their rent, monthly rent, going to increase with particular some percentage, including the maintenance charge. Also, I observed the tenants are reported problems to the landlord, but mostly no action was taken for a long time. And uh, tenants like me and others have approached to the TCSC or to the area council to fix the problem, even they have got nothing change. Residents need some assurance that it is to save to live in the homes and living in a secure home is a basic part of a decent quality of life. So when housing repairs are not done, it affects our lives. And some residents got sick. People feel worried about their safety and health. Most tenants are, I think, migrants and have low incomes. And some seniors mostly are on ODSP. They are suffering a lot with, sub, with such, uh, such housings. They are stuck in such situations. And uh, according to my opinion, many residents are facing and experiencing mental health issues due to such uh, COVID-19 situations due to decrease in the incomes as well as the mental health issues. So according to my opinion, housing is very important for people living in the Torontos. Basically, I am residing in the Waban community of the Scarborough areas, and people like affordable housing because nowadays rent are going to increase so much I'll have to wrap in up, comparison. Please. So that's that's my 
my request to the budget committee uh, to to program that one that will thank you support very much. and end. thank you thank you any questions seeing none yeah. members i've just put, i've just been informed that uh, uh one of the other uh, lucy drummond who was having challenges connecting has just connected so we'll lucy will be the last uh deputation uh, before the evening session so lucy go ahead Is Lucy Drummond there? Well, I guess we're still having some challenges. Oh, Lucy, can you hear us? Unfortunately, just say if you can hear us, maybe if you can send in your deputation, uh, if you can uh, email it in, that would probably be the best. Uh, if not, um, if you have some time uh, in the evening session, maybe you can call in and try to get back on that. So anyway, so I do apologize about that. Um, I need a motion to receive the public uh, presentations. Councillor Nunziata will move. All in favor? Opposed? That's carried. Uh, again, thank you for everybody who came out uh, today and this afternoon. Our next uh, session will be at six o'clock. As I understand, we have uh, 19 people who have registered for the evening session. Uh, we'll see everybody at six o'clock and thank you.